we can assign numerical ages to rocks using absolute dating. But absolute or radiometric dating only works on certain types of rocks. For rocks that absolute dating does not work on, we have to use what's called relative dating. And that's what I'll be talking about in this video, along with geologic time and the time scale in general. I'll start by introducing the geologic time scale so we're all familiar with the major periods and eras and eons of the time scale. Then I'll go into relative versus absolute dating, exactly what the differences are there. Then I'll talk about the principles that we use to relatively date rocks, as well as how they were used to actually construct the geologic time scale before absolute dating was a thing. And of course, to talk about relative dating, we have to talk a little bit about stratigraphy, specifically biostratigraphy using fossils to relatively date rocks, magnetostratigraphy using magnetic properties of rocks, and lithostratigraphy using the rock types. So just as an overview of the major eons, eras, periods, and epochs or epochs of the geologic time scale here, we have the Hadean, Archean, Proterozoic, and Phanerozoic eons. The Phanerozoic is spread out in this time scale figure because that is the current eon that we are living in, and that is also the eon that we know most about because it has the most complete fossil record. And that is broken down into the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic eras, which in total have gone from about 540 million years ago to today. And these eras are broken out into major periods. The periods in the Paleozoic include the Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, Carboniferous, and Permian. And the Carboniferous is sometimes broken up into sub-periods, the Mississippian and Pennsylvanian. And then the Mesozoic is the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous. And the Cenozoic is the Paleogene, Neogene, and Quaternary. The Paleogene and Neogene used to be combined into what was called the Tertiary. That's why it was always the KT boundary for the Cretaceous to Cenozoic um, boundary and extinction event. But um, now we call it the KPG, so Paleogene, PG boundary. And who knows why we use K for Cretaceous. <laughs> I think it has to do with the roots of the word. I don't know. But anyway, the epochs that you typically have to know for a typical, you know, geology major or class or whatever are the ones that are associated with the Cenozoic era, because again, that's the most recent and we know the most about those and have the most complete record of those uh, epochs. So these include the Paleocene, Eocene, Oligocene, Miocene, Pliocene, Pleistocene, and Holocene. Scene, which is the one we are currently in. If you have a professor that makes you memorize these for God knows why, then you can check out my geologic timescale song where I put all of these in a song so it's easier to remember and I'll link that to the top right for you. What I love so much about the geologic timescale though is that most people put it on this not to scale figure where the Phanerozoic, the current eon, is spread out to immense proportions in order to show all the detail that we know about it. But when in reality, when put to the correct scale, the Hadean, Archean, and Proterozoic, the pre-Cambrian or pre-Phanerozoic time is, it's, it's dominant. It takes up the major part of the time scale because it was literally 4 billion years of Earth's history, so most of Earth's history. And so when you're looking at timescale figures, just remember that they're generally not at all to scale. So how was the geologic timescale constructed? What are the breaks between time periods and epochs and all of that based on? Is it absolute or relative dating? Well, before I will answer that, I want to talk a little bit about the difference between relative and absolute dating. Relative dating is qualitative and absolute dating is quantitative. You can get numerical ages, of course, with certain error bars, with absolute dating with just one rock. But relative dating is qualitative. You can only get dates of the rocks that are relative to other rock layers or rock formations. For example, in this figure here, you can see the lower layers are typically older than the upper layers. But of course, there's intrusions and exceptions to this that we'll go over later in the video. So relative dating is exactly what it sounds like. It's dating the rocks relative to each other, whereas absolute dating is dating the rocks numerically based on their chemistry. I talk about that in a lot of other videos um, that are shown down here on the screen. I will link one to the top right for you. I'll link the absolute dating one to the top right. It's a very old one, but it goes over the gist of it. The stable versus radioactive is a good one too. Um, and then I also have one about how we dated Earth, so you can check those out. So now let's talk about relative dating 
principles, the principles we use to date rocks relatively, because it's not just that, you know, the older layers are the lower ones. There's a lot of strategic principles that come into play. First things first, some major people that had a hand in creating these principles are Nicholas Steno and William Smith, as well as James Hutton and George Cuvier, who all came together with their, you know, independent lines of work to come up with these principles of relative dating over centuries of work, as you can see. The first principle is just what we were talking about on the previous slide, that older layers are typically on the bottom and younger layers are on the top. This is called the principle of superposition. Basically, the younger layers deposit on top of older previously deposited layers of rock. We also have the principle of original horizontality. This is the principle that states basically that the layers are originally deposited horizontally, so that if you come to an outcrop where there was a bunch of angles and folds, that was probably post-depositional, after deposition and in the process of deformation. There's also the principle of lateral continuity, basically stating that the layers of rock are laterally continuous such that if you have erosion that occurred in between them, you can still correlate between the rock layers that should be from the same event rather than separate depositional events. Up to this point, these all make good sense, uh, but then we get to some of the ones that kind of complicate things a little bit, such as the principle of intrusive relations. So this is basically when it comes to igneous intrusions, these can come from below. And so anytime you have igneous intrusions that come up from the mantle and disrupt the previously deposited layers of rock, those are younger than the layers of rock that they're intruding rather than older, even though they're below technically when it comes to like the layers of rock, like superposition principle. There's also the principle of cross-cutting relations that can also apply to uh, intrusions, but not always. For example, when you have intrusions of like igneous dikes, for example, that cut across previously deposited layers as they shoot up from the mantle or magma chamber or whatever, they shoot up into the previously deposited layers. And when they do so, they're cutting across the previous layers. Because they're cutting across these layers, you know it's younger than those layers because it's cutting across them. I'll show an example that's more clearly imaged later, I promise. This not only applies to intrusions, but also faults and fractures. These are younger when they cut across the layers. And lastly, we have the principle of inclusions, which is, again, pretty simple. Basically, when you have something like this, for example, this conglomerate with clasts, you know the clasts are older than the matrix or cement material holding them together. So this is where I promised that I was going to make it all make sense, those intrusion and cross-cutting relation uh, principles. So let's just go through it to order these geologic events or depositional layers chronologically. First things first, we know principle of superposition states that the oldest layer should be at the bottom. This would be A. Well, A is not cutting across any other layers, and it's actually being cut across, so that makes sense. A is the oldest layer. The second layer was deposited on top of A, and that's B. The third layer was deposited on top of B, and that's C. All of this makes a lot of sense so far. So the fourth layer would probably be D, right? Well, no. If we look at the label, we see this is an igneous sill. This is what I was talking about. Igneous intrusions can come up and fill the in-between layer space of older sedimentary depositional layers of rocks, and that forms a layer. But if you know the composition is igneous, and you can see that there's clasts in here that were ripped up from these other formations and incorporated into the sill, then you know that this has to be younger than the blue and the yellow layers because it actually disrupted them. It incorporated their class into its, its layer. That means that they had to be there before it came along and formed that sill. So now we know that E is number four, not D. Then we have the question of whether the igneous dike came first or the igneous sill came first. 
The igneous dike is cross-cutting all of these layers, including the igneous sill, meaning that the dike has to be younger than the sill itself, or else the sill would be cutting across the dike. So the sill is next. It was deposited after number four. Then we have the question of whether the dike is older or younger than the rest of these layers up here. And because G comes across and cuts across all of the older layers, it has to be younger than all of those, including F. So the dike, layer F, is number six. Then we have a pretty easy time with G, H, I, J, and K. But remember here that we're ordering geologic events, not just rock layers. So always remember when you're doing a test or something to order all the events, including the erosion, number 12 here. We have erosion of layers 10 and 11 here, and that would be the last geologic event that occurred um, based on this picture, at least. So now that we know what relative dating is and how we do it, how we use the principles to relatively date rocks, and we know what absolute dating is, we know we use the chemistry of the rock to date the rock numerically, we can come back to the question of what the geologic timescale is based on absolute or relative dating. Well, the numbers associated with the geologic timescale are a little misleading because actually it's based almost completely on relative dating, specifically fossils or biostratigraphy. We use fossils to kind of indicate where breaks should be in the geologic record, or at least we used to. Now we heavily use absolute dating and we've gone and assigned numbers to all of these breaks or boundaries in between time periods and we've adjusted them many many times and we've gone more specific with epochs and ages and all of that but originally when we first built the time scale it was based largely on the fossil record this is because early geologists found distinct fossils in different rock units. They also observed biological overturn events in other words extinction events where the biota distinctive of one period would kind of have this rapid ending for a lot of it, or at least diminishing of their numbers for a lot of the, that biota of that previous period, and turn over and do this new diversification thing in the next period with a whole, whole different uh, suite of biota that was often very distinct from the previous period. So because of all these extinction events observed in the rock record, they were able to make these boundaries between periods based on extinction events. That's why you always hear the end such and such mass extinction or the late whatever mass extinction. That's because they're always the end of periods right before a boundary because we built it with that in mind. We built the time scale based on basically extinction events. And this is easily seen if we look at extinctions throughout the rock record. We can see the Cambrian to Ordovician period here. This boundary was marked by an extinction. It's not one of the big five mass extinction events that I talk about in a lot of my videos, but remember, those are not the only mass extinctions in Earth history. There's been a lot. Then we have the Ordovician to Silurian mass extinction. I have talked about this one. This is one of the big five. The Silurian to Devonian mass extinction. The late Devonian or Devonian to Carboniferous boundary mass extinction. This is also one of the big five. The Mississippian and Pennsylvanian one. Again, the Carboniferous can be broken up into the Mississippian and Pennsylvanian subperiods and there was a big glaciation event and mass extinction during this time, the Carboniferous to Permian or Pennsylvania to Permian boundary, and the end Permian extinction, of course, that's the largest extinction event of all time. You can see the huge dip in number of genera or diversity in that time. Then we have the late Triassic mass extinction, another one of the big five. Then we have the KT or KPG boundary mass extinction at the end of Cretaceous when the dinosaurs became largely extinct, but not all periods were separated based on distinctive fossils and major extinction events. Some, such as the Cretaceous period, the last period in the Mesozoic era, were separated based on mythology. The Cretaceous is marked by extensive chalk deposition, and this is how geologists initially separated it from the Jurassic, and then its upper boundary with the Cenozoic era is separated, of course, with the KT or KPG extinction event. Since the construction of the timescale fossils and lithology, and of course geochemistry and absolute dating have allowed more distinctions of periods, epochs, ages, etc. Now, stratigraphy is largely what drives these distinctions and discoveries in the rock record. And stratigraphy is just the study of stratified or layered 
rocks. A big part of stratigraphy is correlation among rocks from basically all around the world, so that we can try and recognize when two separate or multiple separate sections of rocks or outcrops are actually representative of one stratigraphic unit or one geologic time period based on fossil content. This allows us to fill in the erosional gaps in the rock record, at least to some extent. And we can correlate rock units based on a few different things. We can correlate them based on rock type or lithology. We can correlate them based on fossil content. We can use age if absolute dating is possible on those layers. And sometimes we can even use magnetic properties. When we use fossils to relatively date or correlate rock units, this is called biostratigraphy. When using biostratigraphy, index or guide fossils are crucial in understanding where in the geologic timescale you're looking at when you're looking at rocks. What are index fossils? Well, index fossils are basically just these perfect little timestamps on rocks. They're fossils that represent such a specific time range that you know when you're looking at that rock and it has that fossil in it that you're in the Pennsylvanian period, for example, or whatever, because the fossil was only in that period. And so they're really useful when, for example, you have sedimentary rocks that can't be dated using radiometric or absolute dating. There are five major criteria that fossils must meet in order to count as index fossils and be used this way. One, they must have been abundant. Two, they must have been easily distinguishable from other fossils. An example of great index fossils are basically all ammonites. Ammonites are big cephalopods that are now extinct but were really dominant in the Mesozoic era. And although the Mesozoic era is a big, big time block that isn't very specific, we can get way more specific by looking at these suture patterns or these squiggly lines on the ammonite fossils because that tells us what specific type of ammonite it was and that can tell us the more specific time range that that ammonite should have been around for, and that can help us narrow down the time period that we're looking at in the rock record. Index fossils also have to be geographically widespread. If they're not, they're not much use in correlating rocks in different geographic locations. They also had to have been short-lived, like I mentioned earlier, which makes sense because this allows the dating of rocks to a specific time period rather than a really broad range. And lastly, they had to occur in many different sedimentary rock types. In other words, they had to be of relatively high preservation potential. For example, soft-bodied organisms or land animals or things like mosquitoes, for example, that only get preserved in amber, typically. These would not be good index fossils. And so things like ammonites with shells, hard parts that can become preserved in a lot of different sedimentary depositional environments and stay preserved well, those are great index fossils. In terms of examples of great index fossils, we've got ammonites, as I've just been talking about this whole time, fusilinids or other forams, foraminifera. These are microorganism protists that lived in very specific time ranges. Well, fusilinids, foraminifera are still around. They've been around for basically the entire geologic time scale since the Cambrian. And foraminifera of pretty much any kind are really great index fossils, but I mentioned fusilinids specifically because I know that their time range was was the Mississippian, Pennsylvanian, and Permian, or just the Carboniferous and Permian. And they had very specific types of fusilinas around in each one of those time blocks. So it is pretty easy for me to tell when I see a type of fusilina in a rock, I know if I'm in the Permian, the Pennsylvanian, or the Mississippian. Trilobites are great index fossils for the Paleozoic era, not just trilobites in general, but specific types of trilobites that lived throughout the Paleozoic. I have a trilobite video that I'll link up to the top right for you, which goes over which types or orders of trilobites lived the distinctive periods of the Paleozoic. And they're all very physically distinct from one another. So you can basically tell if you look at a certain type of trilobite that you're in a certain time period of the Paleozoic, which is really helpful. But pretty much, guys, all other invertebrates, there are certain invertebrates that are not great for index fossils, like Lingula brachiopods, for example. Those have been around like since the Cambrian and have not changed physically for a long time. They look kind of like this. Um, but there are so many other great invertebrate index fossils that are, they fit all the criteria of what a good index fossil will be. So you might be wondering, is biostratigraphy still relevant today, even though we have absolute or numerical 
aging. We have the ability to go in, look at the geochemistry of that rock and say the age. Why would we ever need biostratigraphy? Well, it's absolutely still relevant. No pun intended. Absolute dating, as I mentioned previously, only works on very specific rock types. Typically, well, igneous is the best type. When you have rocks that crystallize directly from magma or lava, like igneous rocks, you're dating the rock when you look at its geochemistry. But when you have sedimentary rocks, for example, that are amalgamated grains from all different types of sources that come together to become compacted and lithified together as a sedimentary rock, all of those grains from all of those sources will give different ages. They're not crystallizing all at the same time. And I talk way more about how absolute radiometric dating works in other videos, so I'm not going to go into detail here. The point is, it doesn't really work well on most sedimentary rocks. There are ways to date the depositional age of sedimentary rocks or to absolutely date or radiometrically date layers above or below sedimentary rocks. For example, a lot of sedimentary outcrops have some sort of like volcanic ash layer or lava flow above or below them that you can use to then say, well, this is in between this absolutely dated layer at blank million years old and this absolutely dated layer at blank million years old. So this sedimentary layer that we can't absolutely date has to be in between blank and blank million years old. So you can use a lot of different methods to do this, but fossils are still very helpful in correlating sedimentary rocks around the world and are just, it's one of the best ways to do so. Magnetic stratigraphy or magnetostratigraphy is used basically by looking at the magnetic properties of rocks. Motion in the iron-rich liquid outer core of Earth has generated Earth's magnetic field and Earth, because of this, has a magnetic north and south pole that occasionally switch. And because iron minerals that crystallize in igneous rocks, for example, align with the current magnetic field of Earth at that time when it's crystallizing, we can look at this, you know, magnetic alignment throughout the rock record and see when the poles were where. Iron mineral grains can even realign when settling in water, for example, to become incorporated in sedimentary rocks. So sometimes sedimentary rocks can have magnetic signatures that represent the Earth's magnetic field at the time they formed as well. Once in the rock, the iron minerals preserve the magnetic field signature from when that rock formed. This is useful for multiple reasons. Not only can we correlate rocks with the same magnetic signature, you know, from different geographic locations, but we can also study Earth's magnetic field and when and why it switches, especially when we use absolute dating combined with magnetic signature correlations. Magnetic signatures are most often found and used in igneous rocks, and absolute dating is also mostly used in igneous rocks. And so we can look at both the absolute ages and the magnetic signature of these rocks to kind of basically track Earth's magnetic north pole movement throughout Earth's history and try and understand why it's migrated and all of that. Now moving to lithostratigraphy, distinguishing rock units based on lithology or the physical and chemical characteristics of the rock is called lithostratigraphy. Litho just means rock. Lithostratigraphic unit types include supergroups, which are broken down into groups, which are broken down into formations, which are broken down into members. Formations or rock formations are probably the most common term actually used uh, in, you know, just speaking with somebody, you typically are like, oh, that's the such and such formation when you're like a geologist and you just like talk about these things. <laughs> Using this categorization of lithostratigraphic units, we can actually construct stratigraphic columns or sections that can be made basically by mapping an outcrop in vertical succession. So you have like the oldest rocks at the bottom, the youngest ones at top, and then you, you know, describe things about each one of those rock formations or um, groups. This is an example from the Franklin Mountains in El Paso, where I currently go to school. And so you can see all the formation names here and the group names here. The El Paso group includes formations like McKelligan Canyon, etc. So this is kind of how you'd break out things into a strat column. There's a lot of different formats of strat columns though, and I'm hopefully going to make a future video about how to make strat columns for those of you out there who are currently taking said strat. 
using stratigraphic columns and correlating them across large areas, we can actually create entire cross sections, which is just like a cake slice looking at the in innards of a region based on what the stratigraphic columns are telling us. But one thing you might be wondering about stratigraphy in general and the vertical succession of rocks is how and why rocks from different depositional environments deposit on top of one another rather than side to side. You know, when we go to the beach, the beach depositional environment and the deeper abyssal plain depositional environment are adjacent, not on top of each other. So why in the rock record do they become on top of each other? Well, this is because depositional environments are always migrating. An example of where we see this is in the Cambrian during a transgression or basically a sea level rise when there was inland migration of the sea. When you have the migration of the sea inland or basically sea level rise, you get a vertical succession of shallow sand deposits overlain by deeper muddy and carbonate deposits. So you've got the yellow sand here, the gray mud, and the blue carbonates here. And eventually, if you took a strat column of this middle section, you can see they're all laying on top of each other because over time, this is a migration of the depositional environments, a migration of the sea, a migration of that margin. Regression is the exact opposite of transgression. It's the basinward migration of the sea margin, of the basin margin. And this can be driven by sea level fall. And when you have a lowering of the sea level, you're going to get the opposite direction of depositional environment migration and the opposite succession. So instead of shallower deposits overlain by deeper ones, you're going to get the deeper deposits overlain by shallower deposits. And that's what's shown in this bottom left figure. You had transgression in the top part, and then you had another regression in the bottom part. And now the carbonates the deeper carbonates and the deeper muds are overlain by the shallower sand deposits. And this entire succession, if we took a strat column in the middle here, that would show both a transgression and a regression sequence. And this is cool because it allows us to understand, for example, sea level rise and fall through time and when it has occurred and where it has occurred and all of that. And of course, I cannot put this video out without discussing unconformities. Unconformities are surfaces of non-deposition or erosion. The most recognizable or obvious unconformities in my mind are angular unconformities, where you have angled layers, layers that were folded or tilted in some way, and then they were cut off by erosion, and then layers deposited horizontally again. The second type of unconformity is non-conformities. These are also somewhat distinctive because this separates either metamorphic or igneous rocks from sedimentary strata. So if you have an igneous intrusion come into contact with sedimentary strata, then you have an unconformity there. You've got the younger sedimentary strata or layers on top and the lower igneous intrusion at the bottom. And the last type of unconformity is a disconformity. This is just basically an erosional surface in between sedimentary strata. So the strata above and below are horizontal. There's no angles like in angular unconformities, but you can tell that there had been erosion in between these depositional events. So I hope you guys enjoyed learning about geologic time and relative dating. I know that I have this old video on my channel about that, but I just felt like I could have covered it a little bit better. So that's why I'm making this one. And if you want to check out more about absolute dating now, I will link a couple videos up here that I think will be really helpful for you. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.